Okay, so we are going to begin section two of chapter 14 today. Now, we're going to continue on with spontaneous generation just real quickly. So we know that spontaneous, spontaneous generation does not happen on Earth. So in other words, we cannot have a living thing come from something non-living. We have to start with something living to give rise to something else that is living. So with this, where did the first cell come from? Where did the first um, living thing come from? It's like the old chicken and the egg thing. What came first, the chicken or the egg? You know, obviously probably the chicken came first because if the egg came first, we wouldn't have anything to sit on the egg to keep it warm. So yeah, but anyway. So let's just talk about Earth. So we think that Earth is just about five billion years old. Now. When Earth was forming, and along with some other things forming, we think that our solar system was just a big swirling mass of gas and dust, and what happened was all of this started to pull together into different areas, making the Sun, making the Earth, making um, all these different planets. So there's our lovely, hey, there's Superman. Uh, there's our lovely Sun there. So. We first created the sun. Then all of that remaining dust and debris, like, like I just talked about, formed the Earth and all of our other planets. Okay? Um, now, at first, guys, we didn't have Earth as we know it today. Earth was a lot different, especially when we talk about early gases on Earth. But Earth started to grow from this dust and debris, and we started to actually have gravitational pull because Earth was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, um, about 400 million years ago, Earth kind of grew to a, a point where it was actually large. So we estimate Earth to be about 4 billion years old. Is it how it is today? No, it's definitely not. Okay, so Earth got bigger and bigger and bigger, and we started to create an atmosphere on Earth. We started to have different gases on Earth. Our gases that were originally there started to change. But why we think it is about 4 billion years old is we are able to actually look at some of the things on Earth and do radiometric dating uh, using radioactive isotopes. So these are just elements that are radioactive. And we can determine how much of that element has decayed over time. And that's giving us that four, a little bit over 4 billion um, year old time period for when Earth was established. Okay, so this is, if you guys remember from uh, chapter two, just to review, uh, yeah, this is from a while ago. Uh, we talked about isotopes in the last slide, and if you remember an isotope from chapter two, this is an element that has the same number of protons, so that never changes, but our number of neutrons change. So that's what an isotope is. Uh, for instance, you guys in your bodies, you have carbon-13, you have carbon-12, you have probably very little, uh, if any, but carbon-14, which is radioactive. Over time, these carbons decay into carbon-12. Now carbon-12, carbon, all carbon has six protons, okay? Let me write that for you here. So carbon has six protons. If we have carbon-12, what this means is we have six neutrons in it. We just do 12 minus six and we get six neutrons. If we have carbon-13, we do 13 minus six and we get seven neutrons. And then carbon-14 would have one more so it has eight neutrons. So these are isotopes, three different isotopes of carbon. We have carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. All right, most abundant is carbon-12. That's the one that is most abundant on Earth. But you guys can see that we do have other ones, but they're not in uh, as large numbers as carbon-12. And that was the one we went over. You guys can see carbon-12 makes up like 98.9% .9 of Earth. Carbon-13 is only 1.1%, and carbon-14 is hardly any. Okay. So 
So what's going to happen to our isotopes is they are going to decay over time. Some isotopes take a long time to decay. Some isotopes don't take a long time to decay. Uh, for instance, carbon actually does not take a long time to decay. We can lose a good bit of carbon's mass in just under 6,000 years. However, uranium takes billions of years for it to decay. So um, big difference there with how quick these things decay. And what we're talking about when something decays, we're talking about its half-life. And I'll go over an example with you guys on half-life, but it's how long it takes for half of this to disappear. All right, so kind of a gruesome example here, but pretend you die and your body is starting to decay and decompose your half-life would be how long it takes you, pretend you die at 150 pounds, it would be how long it takes you to get to uh, 75 pounds of you left. Again, kind of gruesome. Okay. Um, so here is our carbon half-life. It's 5,730 years. So here's an example. Let's say at um, just normal time, whatever, we'll just start at zero. We have 10 grams of carbon. We have 10 grams of carbon. Right. The half-life of carbon is 5,730 years. So that is one half-life. Okay. So at one down here, one is 5,700 in 30 years. At two half-lives, right, we would have to do 5,730 times two and we would get 11,460 years. So that is two half-lives. That's 11,460 years. Three half-lives, you would just multiply that by three. Four half-lives, you multiply it by four. That's pretty much all you do to determine um, how many years for each of our half-lives. So at the end of our first half-life, this number, that 10, gets reduced by half. So we are left with five grams of carbon. So after 5,730 years, carbon goes from 10 grams to five grams. We are then going to and I always got confused with this when I was in high school. I'm like, okay, so you got start off with 10. We go through one half-life, we get to five. We go through another half-life, we should be at zero, right? You don't go by that original number anymore. You go by five as your new number. So we had 10, we went down to five at the end of one half-life. At the end of two half-lifes, we're taking our new number and dividing it by two. So at two half-lifes, we would have 5 divided by 2, which is 2.5. At the end of 3, we take this number divided by 2, which is 1.25. Okay. The next one, we would have to take, for four half-lives, um, we would take our 1.25 and divide it by 2, and you get a number like 0.625 grams. So that is how you guys do half-lives. All right, so let's say I'm going to give you an easy example here. If one gram of an isotope had a half-life of a billion years, how much would be left over after each of the following intervals? So after one billion years, we would have half of that number. So if we started off with one gram, one billion years, we would have zero. 0.5. 2 billion years, we would have 0 0.25. 3 billion years, so you would take 0.25 and divide it by 2, and you would get 0.125. And then lastly, after 4 billion years, we would have 0 0.0625. So each time all you're doing is taking this above number and dividing it by 2. Again, taking that number, divide it by 2. We're cutting it in half. That's why we're using 2 there. Okay? All right. And 
here again, guys, are your um, half-life. Every element has a different half-life. So you guys can see carbon actually decays very quickly, 5,730 years. Uranium, it is really close to a billion years for uranium-235. Um, it's 704 million years. Now, if we use the radioactive uranium, which is uranium-238, just a different isotope of it, different number of neutrons, you could see it is 4 billion 500 million years. So carbon is not really good to like estimate the dates of dinosaurs and stuff like that because they're what 60 something million years old. But if we use uranium, we can get a better estimate on how old those dinosaurs were just by seeing it the amount of uranium in the rocks around them. Okay. Um, so scientists, some radioactive isotopes they like to use uh, uranium and thorium just because they have very very high half-lives okay. all right so we're gonna get into some experiments here real quick um, what we're going to talk about is some of the early gases on earth that gave rise to life so our first two scientists we're gonna go over is Oparin and Haldane so we know that for us, we are made up of a bunch of organic compounds. We're made up of proteins. We're made up of carbohydrates. We're made up of lipids. And we're made up with, of course, nucleic acid DNA. All of these four macromolecules are made out of carbon. All right. So here's a picture of Oparin and Haldane. And here was their hypothesis, is that they think early atmosphere was composed of a few different gases, uh, ammonia, hydrogen, water vapor, so that's water in just a gaseous form, uh, and carbon. Now the carbon is not just carbon floating. They uh, said it's probably methane, which is like really plentiful in like the guts of cows and stuff like that. And what they think is at high temperatures, these gases could collide together and form amino acids. So that was their hypothesis. Their second part of their hypothesis was that as the earth cooled and the water vapor condensed, so water vapor is condensing into uh, pretty much a liquid form, okay, they think that that water turned into the lakes and the oceans. So we had all this water vapor in the air and then one day it cooled, condensed, and it was just like brrr. Gravity brought it down and we get some oceans and lakes. How would you like to be under that waterfall? That'd be crazy, right? Um, and then they think as the remaining things that were on there may uh, up in you know the atmosphere except the water vapor we're going to make our proteins our lipids our nucleic acids our carbohydrates in other words they are making our macromolecules so they developed this hypothesis both parts of it here's the problem they didn't test it <laughs> all right so they didn't test the hypothesis, so they couldn't really say, oh yes, we are 100% right, this is how everything worked. Why didn't they test it? Well, they really didn't have an idea of how to test it. So a few years after this, two different scientists, Miller and Yuri, took their hypotheses and tested them. So they came up with a way to test the hypothesis. So what they did was they put these early Earth gases, or what uh, Oparin and Haldane assumed to be the early earth gases and they put them in a tube. Now in order for all this stuff to combine they needed some energy source to make our organic molecules to make our amino acids. So what they did was they provided an energy source and they th were thinking okay what energy source was there for early earth? Okay we didn't have like electricity we didn't have like oh hey um, I'm gonna need a battery where's that bunny at where's the energizer bunny at right they didn't have those those types of things back then so what they did was they said okay lightning there was definitely lightning back then so that could have provided the uh, energy needed to put these elements together so what they did in their experiment is they got electrical sparks to simulate the lightning that would have been there on early Earth. Okay? And with all of these gases in there, 
they were able to use the electric sparks, use the lightning in other words, and they were able to actually make amino acids out of it. They were able to make some of our organic compounds that make up us. Okay. All right. Um, now, some of our amino acids, guys, that we are going to find, we think of them as, okay, yeah, they're, they're on Earth. Cool. They actually found the 1970s, this guy here, all right, um, they found that there was a meteorite that fell into Earth, and they studied the outside and inside of the meteorite, and they found amino acids on it. And this is actually the exact meteorite that they uh, found that came from outer space. Uh, it was called the Murchison meteorite. And again, it had amino acids on it. Okay, so microspheres and coacervates, and then we are done for the day. So they found that we could have these cell-like structures called microspheres. And they form spontaneously when in a lab from some of these organic chemicals, some of the lipids, some of the amino acids, uh, some of the carbohydrates. And pretty much what they were was just like a um, cell membrane-like structure. So what they were thinking was these microspheres uh, could have been used to make up the early uh, cell membranes. The other thing they found is something called coacervates. Now, coacervates, these are just droplets, and they found these droplets are made of lipids, amino acids, and sugars. So they're made out of lipids, they're made out of proteins, and they're made out of carbohydrates. So put these two together, and they could have been uh, early cells. They also found that coacervates can um, reproduce in a very simple way, not like mitosis, uh, like our cells, but they pretty much grow and they bud. So they were thinking that, okay, this might have been an early form of cell reproduction and it might have been used to kind of give binary fission, which is the way that prokaryotes reproduce, but it might have been a way to give uh, the prokaryotic cells a means of reproducing their cells. So this is how the cell membrane may have reproduced. Only problem with this is that microspheres and coacervates, yeah, they're like empty vessels. They, they're pretty much like a cell uh, membrane, and that was it, okay? There was no genetic variation between them, so they couldn't respond to natural selection. So that means they couldn't really uh, evolve. So I'm still trying to figure out how the DNA, how the um, nucleic acids got into the cell and actually um, gave us all the characteristics for us. Okay, so that was section two, guys. We will stop here for the day. Uh, have a good rest of your day.